Good evening. It's Saturday the 10th of May. You're tuned in to our 10 p.m. newscast coming to you from Arirang's new centre in Seoul. We start with the latest on the Sewol Ho ferry disaster. Search efforts continue in waters off Korea's southwestern coast on this Saturday. This is the area where the ferry sank 25 days ago with more than 300 passengers trapped inside. Now Hyung Young starts us off. Two more bodies were recovered during overnight rescue operations that went on through the early hours of Saturday morning. The number of confirmed dead now stands at 275 people, with 29 still unaccounted for. Search efforts are continuing in waters off of Korea's southwestern Jindo Island, but gusty winds and high waves brought rescue operations to a halt earlier on this Saturday. With a special warning for heavy winds and waves in effect for the region, an official from the response team reportedly said divers will most likely not be able to resume operations until Monday. Meanwhile, prosecutors raided an office of a ferry operator in the southeastern port city of Busan. It's the first time a passenger ship operator not related to the ferry disaster has been raided since the accident. The company operates two more than 5,000-ton ferries, both built more than 20 years ago. The prosecution is looking into whether the firm abided by safety regulations and also potential corruption charges involving officials at the Korean Register of Shipping. Prosecutors did, however, stress that they do not intend to expand the scope of their probe to target the overall shipping and cruise industry. As for the investigation into the Seolho ferry operator, Cheonghaejin Marine Company, police and prosecutors are reportedly finding more evidence that the practical owner, Yu byung on was indeed involved in the management of the firm. They also reportedly have testimony from Kim Han-sik, CEO of the ferry operator, that he reported the accident to Mr. Yu. As their findings pile up, the investigative team plans on summoning the man in question as early as next week. In the meantime, prosecutors called veteran actress Chun Yang Ja in for questioning on Saturday. She's the president of a media company affiliated with the ferry operator. Na Hyun Gyo, Arirang News. And people from across the country are continuing to pay their respects to the victims of the ferry disaster. So far, more than 460,000 people have visited the memorial altar in Ansan in Gyeonggi-do province. That's where the more than 300 high school students who were on the ferry are from. In total, some 1.6 million people have paid their respects at altars set up around Korea. And tonight, several rallies and candlelight vigils are taking place in Seoul. Different religious and civic groups are paying tribute to the families and offering their support to the families. And they're also calling for the cause of the accident to be identified quickly and those responsible brought, be brought to justice. A top U.S. transportation expert has suggested that Korea should bring the development and improvement of family assistance plans to the forefront of its strategy in dealing with transport-related disasters like the Sewol Ho ferry sinking. In a recent blog post on the uh, top U.S. political website, The Hill, Jamie Finch, who is former Director of Government, Public and Family Affairs at the U.S. National Transportation Safety Board, said the ferry sinking shows how Korea and many other countries around the world have yet to reach even the minimum standards in addressing families' needs after such tragic accidents, pointing out how some of the families of the Sewol Ho victims were traumatized even further when several of the bodies were returned to the wrong families. Finch says the U.S. should use its influence to press Korea to embrace a more thoughtful emergency response that mirrors the openness and standards seen in the U.S. and most of the West. In the rest of the day's news, and North Korea has been making threats again. This time, it says it will respond in the strongest possible way to any South Korean or U.S. provocations related to its recent firing exercises. In an article published in one of its daily Saturday, the North Workers' Party said its military exercises were legitimate preparations to defend itself from outside aggression. Pyongyang says it has not ruled out the use of nuclear weapons in its response in a possible reference 
to a fourth nuclear test. Meanwhile, the U.S. has reiterated that North Korea must take meaningful steps towards denuclearization and refrain from provocations before the resumption of the six-party talks. A spokesperson from the State Department said the U.S. has seen no evidence of North Korea's willingness to stick to its side of that bargain, the six-party talks involving the two Koreas, the U.S., China, Japan and Russia, have been stalled since late 2008. Now, back here in South Korea, and the newly elected floor leaders of the country's two main rival parties met one-on-one -on -one for the first time. On this Saturday, the ruling Senate parties Lee Wang gu and Park yong sun from the main opposition New Politics Alliance for Democracy met behind closed doors. It was a casual meeting over lunch, but the two reportedly talked about how their parties want to deal with the aftermath of the Sewol Ho ferry disaster. The two sides seem to agree on the need for opening an extraordinary session this month, but they are divided on whether a parliamentary probe into the disaster should be launched right away. The two leaders are scheduled to hold an official press conference together on Sunday. That's tomorrow. Meanwhile, more candidates for the June 4th regional elections are being finalized. Five-term lawmaker Nam Gyeong Pil of the ruling party will run for Gyeonggi-do province governor, where the opposition party is still to decide on its candidate. And four-term lawmaker Lee nak -yeon of the opposition party will run for Jolanamdo province governor. Now, in international news, the United Nations Security Council has strongly condemned the abduction of hundreds, hundreds of Nigerian schoolgirls and is demanding their immediate and unconditional release. In a joint statement, the council said the mass kidnappings by the militant Islamist group Boko Haram may amount to crimes against humanity under international law. And uh, U.S. First Lady Michelle Obama has also spoken up on the issue speaking instead of her husband in the weekly presidential address, Mrs. Obama said the mass kidnapping is in fact part of a wider pattern of intimidation facing girls around the world who pursue an education. Scores of militants kidnapped more than 250 girls from a secondary school in a remote part of northeastern Nigeria on April 14th, and the group has threatened to sell them into slavery. U.S., British and French experts are already in Nigeria, scouring the area for any signs of those girls. Now, supporters of Thailand's beleaguered government have been rallying on the outskirts of Bangkok, vowing to defend democracy after Ing Lak Shinawat was ousted as prime minister earlier this week. Pro-government demonstrators are protesting a renewed push by the opposition to install a new unelected leader. Anti-government protesters have been demanding lawmakers help them install a non-elected prime minister by Monday. Inluck's removal on Wednesday came after months of protests, about six months of protests, which spooked investors and caused the number of tourists to tumble. A caretaker government led by Inluck's party is running the country at the moment and says it's working towards holding an election in July. Now, Korean language has become a regular part of the regular curriculum at a school in Brazil. Colegio Daspora in Sao Paulo offers primary education to some 200 students. Kids there have been taking Korean classes already, but only as an optional after-school activity, and they've been doing that since uh, September last year. But now the course has been made mandatory thanks to the rising, ongoing popularity of the Korean wave. Five schools currently provide Korean language classes as an extracurricular activity in the South American country of Brazil, but of them, two more are considering to follow suit and make the course a regular subject in their curriculum. Now, the U.S. government has poured millions upon millions of dollars into a project to get a better understanding of the human brain. Leading the project is a Korean-American professor at MIT, and he believes he knows the key, or he may know the key, to finding out what causes mental illnesses, our Kim Minji reports. 
A connectome is an extensive map of neural connections in the brain. Sebastian Sung, a professor of computational neuroscience at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, introduced the term through a TED conference in 2010, and his book Connectum, How the Brain's Wiring System Makes Us Who We Are, has since become a bestseller in the U.S. So this worm has only 300 neurons and 7,000 connections. Your connectome has, you also have a connectome, and it's 100 billion neurons and 10,000 connections per neuron. In a recent talk with Korean brain scientist, Sebastian Singh stressed the connectomes were the key to uncovering the causes of various mental illnesses such as dementia and autism. He berated the modern science community for focusing their research on brain regions rather than on connectomes. Which enable us to look inside the living human brain and help us figure out what each region of the brain does. But intellectually, that way of understanding the brain is still the same as it was in the 19th century. Professor Singh has an ambitious goal of mapping the neural connections of the human brain. Um, if computers get faster and faster, the same way that they've been getting for 50, the last 50 years, mm -hmm. we should be able to map an entire human connectome, uh, I hope, uh, in my lifetime. If it is as predicted by Professor Sung, the mysteries of the brain would also likely be solved sooner rather than later. Kim Min-ji, Arirang News. Now, taking a brief look at the weather, most of the country is under partly cloudy skies this evening. It will be a relatively mild night, with the overnight low only dipping to 13 degrees in Seoul. More clear, sunny skies are in the forecast nationwide on Sunday, but a band of rain is expected to sweep through sometime in the evening. Daytime highs on Sunday will be in the low to mid-20s. Let's take a look at the weather wherever you are in the world. And those are the stories we have for you at this hour. For more of the latest stories, don't forget to check our website, which can be found at adidang.co.kr forward slash news. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Goodbye.